Hi folks, I am Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatore and I'm very lucky to be here today with Dr Tobias Capwell, the Curator of Arms and Armour at the Wallace Collection and we're in the Wallace Collection um, in the library and we're here today to talk about um, Tobias Capwell's books. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, if you don't own Volume 1 and 2, and we'll talk about these in a second, then if you're interested in learning about armour, I can not really think of any better source to delve into the subject and uh, answer pretty much any question you're going to have about how armour works, how it was developed, certainly in England in the 15th century. Now, these are focused on uh, the armour of the English knight, the first volume is 1400 to 1450, the second volume is 1450 to 1500, so it covers the whole 15th century. But the third book, which is finished now, isn't it? Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. The third book, which is um, due to come out this year, actually covers a lot more than that, doesn't it? Because it covers the whole 15th century, so this whole period of time, and it covers continental armour, and particularly how continental armour was used in England and affected English armour. Yeah. So, first of all, before we delve into that, just briefly, for anyone who doesn't already own these books or know about these books, can you explain to us how this enormous Herculean <laughs> task of making three massive volumes, how it came to happen? How did you come to do yes. it? Yes. Well, this is a project that has taken 23 years, start <laughs> to finish. And... Um, it really finds its roots in um, my work at the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Uh, I joined the staff there in 1996 and then continued on as a kind of part-time curatorial assistant uh, in 1997 and 98 while I was starting my graduate studies. And um, you know, as well as a fabulous collection, huge collection of arms and armor, the Royal Armouries in Leeds also has a fabulous library and archive. Mm. And uh, I used to go there on my lunch breaks and just whenever I could to just pour through different parts of that archive. And one part of it was a hu these huge cabinets of uh, 8x10 black and white photographs mounted on cards. It was like a giant card catalog system. Mm. And a lot of these photographs were taken by the great specialists of the 20th century, like Claude Blair and A.V.B. Norman, mm -hmm. uh, on research trips. And they're photographs of real pieces of armor in other collections, but also manuscript illustrations, relevant sculptures, works of art of all kinds, including uh, a lot of material on high-relief effigies. Right. on funerary monuments of knights. When a, when a medieval knight died, if he could have the money, a funerary monument was set up to motivate prayer for his soul. And these effigies are life-size depictions of these people wearing their armor. Mm. So, you know, for a long time, armor scholars were aware of effigies as an important source of evidence. Mm. But um, as I looked through these photographs, I realized that there was about 10 of these things that I recognized from the standard literature, where an arms and armor scholar has referred to the Beecham effigy in Warwick, most mm. famously. There's like 10 that everybody knows. Mm. But then as I'm looking through, I realized, oh, wait a second, there are loads more of these <laughs> that, no, as far as I knew, had never been published or certainly never published in an arms and armor publication and then i realized that hey although norman and blair and plenty of other great scholars were going around and looking at these my sense was that they'd never looked at them all kind of collectively mm. they certainly ha didn't have the advantages of the digital age where it's easy now to, to, to digest and interpret huge amounts of visual data. Mm. You didn't used to be able to do that. No. Um, so around that time, as I'm discovering that there is this huge body of effigial evidence that show these people in you know wearing these armors, mm -hmm. I was seeing that a lot of the, the armors looked like uh, 
they, they were in styles that I didn't recognize. They weren't Italian. They didn't look German. Some of them looked vaguely Italianate, but they had all sorts of crazy fluting on them and things. And I just thought, what is going on here? Mm. And around that time, I had decided that I wanted to do a PhD. I wanted to be a curator. I wanted to work in museums. And it seemed clear that even if PhDs weren't required for a particular job, they gave you an advantage, certainly. Yeah. And, you know, I guess I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> so I did a PhD. And when it came to finding a subject, I remember my, my advisor saying to me, be careful when you, you choose a PhD subject. It's got to be something that you are sure you are passionate about. It's something you, you know you can work intensively on for years and finish it at the end because starting something is easy, finishing it is hard. <laughs> yes. And so I immediately yeah. thought of these effigies and I thought, I'll go around, I'll look at all of them, I'll photograph them with this newfangled technology of digital cameras, which had only just come out in the late 90s. People forget this now. Much lower resolution than yeah. now, unfortunately. Hey, but. It's, it's, <laughs> the photographs are still in the book. Um, <laughs> And I'll go around and photograph them all. I'll look at them. I'll, and then I'll work out what they say as a, as a collective body of new evidence for armor people. Which nobody had done before with, with English effigies. Right. Um, and, and also, uh, just briefly, that I've always been very interested in brasses, which is something which I'll sort of touched on, but this is primarily looking at effigies. Yeah. And there are some differences, aren't there, between brasses and effigies, I think partially because effigies are higher status quite often. Um, yeah. But, yep, yep, but yep. yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they come into, I into play in different ways. But... For me, you know, I was writing a PhD not on effigies per se. Mm. I was writing about armor. Yeah. My thesis was that there was a distinctive style of English armor design mm. that was different from what was going on on the continent, different from the Italian and the German stuff that we know very well. Yeah. It was different technologically and in the way it functioned. And it was different aesthetically as a work of art as well. Yeah. And that was my thesis. But, and that, that was unrecognized. And it was unrecognized at the time primarily because there is no English armor surviving. There is not a single piece that can be proven to be the work of an English armorer. Mm. So again, I set out to write an exhaustive history of something that no longer exists. I'm, 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 I'm attracted to black holes in the evidence. You know, we, we often, our research is often led by the available evidence, but the available evidence when you're a medieval historian is patchy. And I want to know what's between the patches, what's yeah. in those dark, unknown areas, because something was happening. And if you want to get a better sense of the medieval world as a living, breathing environment, you have to try and go where the evidence is less obvious. But you have to find legitimate and, you know, and strong ways of doing that. So the effigies were my way into that. But I have to supplement them with a lot of other forms of evidence wherever I can. I'll take any kind of evidence. Mm. So you have documentary evidence, you have other pictorial evidence, like brasses, like manuscript illustration, woodcuts, other sculptures, you know, because scu English, English artists created sculpture for yeah. a lot of other reasons besides funerary monuments. Some, alab some English alabaster ended up in Italy and, right. and, and right. France. So yeah. I just tried to just hoover everything up that I could. And then it forms a giant pile and and that was the that was the basis for the PhD. I completed the PhD in 2004, but I never stopped working on it. Mm. You know, most people pass the PhD and that's the end. But I kept going. I just kept working on it because I knew I wanted to publish it. But sometimes a PhD is not at all the same thing as a published work. No. And, and I think today there is actually a lot of pressure 
on PhD candidates to publish PhDs immediately to gain academic credibility and, and, mm. and so forth. But it's often a mistake. Mm. You know, often you need to go away, you need to get more experience, widen your view of your subject, and then come back to it. I just kept working on it. I did a lot of other things, kept working on it, kept working on it. But then the whole problem of publishing it you know, confounded me for years mm. because this I know this is going to be 1,100 pages and I know it's probably going to have three or 4,000 images in it. Uh, and that means, you know, it's going to cost tens of thousands of pounds to produce. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's tried to publish a book on anything will know that as soon as you throw lots of images into it, that colossal because you've got copyright issues and reproduction quality issues and all sorts of issues yeah. um, but the size of it as well like you say yeah. like which publishers out there want to publish right. <laughs> 1100 you know like it's it's just going to be very difficult to find a conventional but, publisher to take it on but even if they are willing to contemplate such a thing you still have to give up some creative control yeah you still have to uh, you know, submit to external editors and, you, you know, the publisher becomes part of the process. They have their idea of what is marketable. And I just wasn't on this project. I was not prepared to compromise at all. And I went through the process. I negotiated with at least three different publishers at different points between about 2008 and, uh, two, and, uh, and 2014. Right. And and, you know, I'd sit down with them and they, they, it would seem like it was, they were totally with me on everything. Uh, and I'd say, you know, look, this is, this is a huge thing. I, I need, for volume one, I'm going to need at least 1,800 images. And they'd say things like, how about 170? Yeah. You know, because <laughs> that's what we've done before. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, oh, are you, yeah, we'll do, this will all be great. You'll have total creative control, um, you know, but... You know, but our designers in Wales. So you know, you're going to have to get yourself there. That's not our problem. You know, stuff like that. Okay. And for any number of reasons, you know, perfectly justifiable from their part, I suppose, the deals fell through, and I and I just couldn't I couldn't get the the traction without being compromising. And in this particular instance, I wasn't prepared to. Do. Well, you did it um, with uh, with Thomas Delmar. Yes. Um, who, who is um, an auctioneer as well um, and um, uh, for many years has published very high quality catalogues for auctions and therefore right. had all of the everything yeah. lined up to, to be able to take this sort of yeah. thing on and um, you have a working relationship with well it was kind of funny because it happened in a very odd way for me it was odd um, I as I was continuing to work on this, I knew that book one was going to be 1400 to 1450. And the heart and soul of that is the Agincourt period. Yeah. Henry V and the last great triumph of the English way of fighting and the knights and the archers together, you know, and it just, and then I'm sitting there in 2013, 2014, thinking the 600th anniversary of the Battle of Agincourt is coming up. If I don't get this book out in 2015, my morale is just going to collapse. <laughs> and I'm, I'm never going to be able to, to bring myself to continue. It's just, it's just gone on too long. I've had too many knockbacks. If it doesn't happen in 2015, I'm just going to give up. But luckily, I was negotiating at that time with a publisher. And it was feeling really good. Um, and then... In like December, November, December of 2014, it fell apart. And it was clear that they weren't actually prepared to do what it was going to take. And for whatever reason, it wasn't going to work. And, and I just saw my, I saw everything fall apart. Mm. And it was like, you know, how, it's gone. It's gone. This is Castillo, um, not Agincourt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that, quite that day, I went down to Tom Del Mar's because I often go and see, I view his objects and his sales before the, before the December sale. Mm. And it, it was a usual thing for a while for me to go down there. And I walked in there and Tom, who I've known for years, immediately said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and it was like, oh, does it, do I look that bad? 
And I said, I explained, I said, this project is just falling apart. It's never going to happen. I have to give up on it. And Tom was just like, that's nonsense. <laughs> he said, he said, I publish two exhibition catalogs a year. I have designers. I have an office full of people. I've got printers down the road. Let's just do it ourselves. And he said, you do everything. You're totally, you know, artistically, creatively, editorially. It's all yours. You go work with my designer, sort out what you want to do, and we'll do it. Uh, and you and did. I, and I thought, <laughs> no, this is crazy. Tom's gone crazy. <laughs> and, then, and then I went away and thought about it, and I realized that it really was as good as it sounded. And this was the way to go. And 2015, yeah. there it is. So volume one, volume two, they've been around for a while now. And um, those of us who are obsessed with such things have um, spent many, many hours poring over both of them. Um, and they are still both available yes. from the publishers. Yes, there are, there are myths and legends circulating in the community that book one is unavailable and completely sold out. And that was almost true until we did actually locate some more in the warehouse huh. and the the publisher still has has some yeah i can't remember quite how many at the moment but it's still on the website you can still buy it it is still it is but, still available. Uh, from on a personal note from me uh, if you love these books and have them i would suggest buying a spare copy because i have i have a spare of one and i need to get a spare of the other just in case you know a, a child knocks over a cup of tea or something like that but um if you haven't got one or two yet there is a point in time where they might become unavailable just to give you a sense Book one is nearly sold out. They, mm. All of these books have 2,500 copy print runs. Um, book one came out in 2015. It's almost gone. 100 copies left. Wow. Um, so that's almost sold out yeah. in seven years, right? Mm. Book two has been out for just less than a year. And I think, I'd have to check, but I think nearly half of the print run is already gone. Right. So it's selling much faster. Yeah. I mean, maybe you expect that, but... Um, I don't know. But you know. anyway, I mean, the basic message is if you haven't got both of them and you want either or both of them, then get them while they're still available. Because unfortunately, in 10 years' time or however long, um, you're going to be paying way more money for them on places uh, like um, AB Books or wherever where, where they will just come available when someone happens to have a second-hand copy, you know. So, um, so yeah, grab them new now while you can. Now, on a similar topic, let's move on to book three. So, so yes, book three, which is uh, widely anticipated for numerous reasons, partly because book one and two were much loved and people are looking forward to book three, uh, but also because book three deals with material which hasn't been covered in books one and two um the same period but looking more at continental armor and influences from the continent yeah. um you mentioned something t to me interesting which connects back to something we've just been talking about about how coming out of your phd that formed the nucleus and the, certainly the, the beginning of these books but you also mentioned how you know people sometimes publish too early in their PhDs and how your ideas about certain things changed a lot mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. doing your PhD and which has a particularly potent effect on this book three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, my, my PhD was now quite different in numerous ways from the published versions of these wor works. Uh, don't worry, you don't need to chase the PhD down. It's vastly inferior than the published work. <laughs> it's flawed in all kinds of ways. You, honestly, you don't need to read it. Um, this, this is the definitive version of what I have to say on the subject. Um, but in the original PhD, I wrote quite extensively on what was already known about the development of armor in Italy and Germany. Because for the point of proving my thesis, my doctoral thesis, if I'm going to say that English armor was different, yeah. I have to have established what it was different from. Yes. So I had to spend quite a long time writing about Italian and German armor in general. Now, I've since decided that there's, there's really nothing in that part of the PhD that I want to publish. Um, 
it, you know, it was me at an early stage, very early stage of my career, kind of blundering through the subject. There might be still some some virtue in parts of its approach or whatever, but I just it wasn't part of the the synthesized published version of this work, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, but but there was another crucial part at the end of the PhD. The end of the PhD had a, like a five-page appendix. Maybe it was a little longer. But it was a short appendix that just focused very quickly, but crucially, on the depiction of Italian armor on English effigies. There are not many that show Italian armor on English effigies, but there are a few, and they were really, really important for the purposes of the PhD mm. because they demonstrated categorically that English effigy carving uh, achieved very high fidelity in the appearance of the armor. Because the Italian armor survives. Right. Yeah. So you You've can got compare. something to yeah. compare. Yeah. They're like, they're like a little laboratory sample of Italian armor on English effigies, and you've got the real Italian armor of the same period that you can compare it to. And that demonstrates the accuracy. Mm. And, and so that gives us a lot more confidence when we go back to look at the English-style armor on uh, English effigies, where we don't have those comparisons, but we've already been able to establish that generally the expectation is that you need to represent the armor as accurately as you possibly can. Mm. So that, that five-page, very focused appendix, um, my, net, my original intention was to integrate an expanded version of that into book two of English Night. Mm -hmm. And there were only ever going to be two books because there was a part of me that just you know, emotionally and physically couldn't handle the idea of three books. I remember there was a period we met up, we met up to look at an effigy, um, and um, in a previous video, actually, check yeah. out previous videos that we've done together. Yes. But, uh, and at that point, I think you were involved in a flip-flop between, it's going to be three books, and then at some point, not long after, you said, no, it's going to be two books, and then you went back to three yeah. books. Yeah, no, I, I had really settled on it only being two books. Right. And I... After book one came out, I spent several years writing, revising, expanding book two into its final form. Because in, in, in the discussion, there were a lot of things that needed to be in that that weren't in the first book. Uh, discussion of church helmets and things, which weren't part of my PhD at all. Yeah. But if you're talking about armor in general, it's an important thing. So I was expanding book two and I was writing, I'm saying this is finished, this is everything. I'm going to deal with all these continental references in book two as well, and it'll be fine. And I wrote all of that revision all the way through the spring of 2021. And then I thought to myself, this seems like it's getting a bit long. <laughs> Maybe I should just do a word count, which I hadn't done in years. <laughs> and um, and I thought I thought book two is probably going to be maybe twenty percent bigger than book one, right? I thought that's what it's going to be. That's within tolerable limits. But I did the word count and I realized it was twice as long. <laughs> As, as book one. So un and, uh, unedited, that would have been twice the thickness of that. Yeah, just, just impo <laughs> but impossible. Yeah. I mean, logistically impossible. Even if the binder will consider binding a 700-page book, yeah. um, I could never have done all the image rights and image editing and licensing and design of a 700-page book. It just, just, it just filled me with, with horror and despair. <laughs> so... I realized I had two books here. So I published the first half, which is the, the, the story of English armor, up to 1500. And now I have this final book, which I, since the realization of length, I have since really, really sharpened and honed it. To be something new. We don't want to lose too much, though. We want. We no, still. No, 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 no. There's no loss. <laughs> okay, There's no good. loss. This is all about gain. 
Cool. It's all about gain. Yes, when you sharpen something, maybe you lose a little bit of material, but but what you gain is vastly. Yeah, I've vastly got this, as an armor fanatic. I have never felt that these books are too big. I just want more and more and more. I want you to just keep doing. Well, book, book, so book three is is titled Armor of the English Knight, Continental Armor in England, fourteen thirty five to fifteen hundred. Okay. So we go, we widen the chronology a bit, but now we are looking at the presence of continental foreign armor in England. The degree to which the English used it, yeah. why they used it, what kinds did they use, for what reasons, what is the wider historical and documentary background for the importation of armor into England, how were the great centers like Italy... Um, catering to foreign markets. Mm. What's the evidence for the Italians being aware of what Western Europeans liked mm. and how can we trace that part of the subject? So a, a lot of people listening might think 1435 to 1500. Why 1435? Yeah, Am I correct in thinking that's because that's the period when you have recognizable, a very recognizable yes. type of Italian yeah, that's armor? Exactly, yeah. That's absolutely precisely why yeah. it's 1435. I know for a fact that the English had Italian and French and Flemish and you know maybe even a little bit of German armor in the 14th century. Yeah, there's records of it being we, imported. It's, yeah, and it's there. We yeah. know it. the 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 problem for me though is I am predominantly a, a, a historian of visual art in a sure. broader sense. Yeah, and I'm dealing with visual sources and I'm wanting to rebuild real armor and. Yes, there was Italian armor present in England before 1435, but you can't recognize it in the visual sources. And we know from the documents, too, that sometimes English armorers were importing Italian bassinets, for example, and then decorating them in the English style. Oh, really? Interesting. So good luck recognizing that on an yeah, effigy. Yeah, and I'm sure it happened with other elements as well, you know, uh, uh, yeah. breastplate, cuirass. Um, yeah. and but right around 1435 you start seeing things that look a lot like the Avanta armor in Glasgow, for yeah. example, on English brasses. There's the asymmetric plain Italian armors, clear as day. That's when they start appearing on the monuments, too. And brasses, and yeah, that's when, yeah. that's when the whole thing takes off from from the point of view of the visual source. So I think one of the most famous uh, painted sources from around time is probably Paolo Uccello's Battle of San Romano, which really typifies this style of yeah. uh, Italian yeah. armour, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And you do start to see certainly that you know the characteristic pauldrons and well armed defences as a whole start to appear on brasses that I've been looking at for years mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Um, one thing I've always wondered, and obviously this will be dealt with, I'm sure, in depth in your book, but um, for viewers, I think it would be nice to ask this. I think we often think about armors as a, as a whole thing, but I've always got the impression that a person might sometimes change or update an element of their armor. Yes. And some of the brasses, to me, uh, look like an English cuirass with Italian arms yes. uh, and an English helmet. Yes. Do you think that's... I know it. Okay. I know it. I've talked about it in the book. Uh, it's something that you have to be really sensitive to because different parts of you know, armor is like clothing. Yeah. You can have an old favorite cuirass and update the arms and legs. Or you can have an Italian armor, but you're an English knight and you want an English great bassinet. Yeah. So you adapt it that way. The sources, once you start thinking about that, the sources are full of stuff like that. And you see it on effigies as well as on brasses. Uh, there was one effigy, a later 15th century one, early 16th century even, that was really confounding me for a while. Because I couldn't fit it into any of my categories. You know, I had one category that was the late English Substyle, okay. and then I had another category which was the new Anglo-Flemish style of the same period, and I, I kept going back and forth. Well, that's an English cuirass, definitely, but the arms and legs are totally Italian, Flemish. What is going on here? And then I realized that that's what you're looking at. That, that there are there's a fair amount of heterogeneous right. armors, and and it goes in time period too. One of the most important 1480s. Uh, effigies representing a Flemish armor that I talk about in length in the third book. He, the armor is totally up to the minute, four, mid 1480s, Flemish. And then he's got a pair of 1450s English gauntlets on it. <laughs> 
and it looks really weird and really incongruous, but there it is. And, you know, in my experience as an armor user, and all my friends have been armor users for 30 years, I've seen weird idiosyncrasies like this develop on, on everybody's armors. It's a natural part of the process. I was 100% going to say exactly the same thing, and particularly with gauntlets, because gauntlets are so difficult to get right. And, you know, your hands are your hands. They're such a special thing, and the way you interact with weapons and all ride a horse. And, and I think I can totally imagine in a world in which a person updates their harness but they're like i just really love the way my old gauntlets work or you know maybe they got new gauntlets and they never really worked fantastically and so they just went oh well i'll keep those to the side yeah. now, you know. and that's and that's for me wonderful because it shows how important it is for um, martial arts practitioners and armor fighters to have a role in the historical research yeah and you know I, I, I have the luxury of being both an academic specialist and a martial arts practitioner. You know, so I, I start to see to see that mm. that you know the weird gauntlets might not even get recognized yeah. otherwise, or if they do get recognized, we attribute that to the carver not knowing what he's doing or making it up off the top of his head, when actually it's a wonderful tantalizing glimpse into the real world that these things grow out of yeah so in the from 1435 to 1500 as an overview in england we've clearly got english armor we've clearly got italian armor um we've probably got italian armor made for export in the english french whatever style yep. we've got flemish armor yep we don't have any german armor or do we have any at no. all there is in in book three there is a short appendix. It's like eight or ten pages. Right. And the appendix is entitled um, something like the... I should, I should know what the title is. But <laughs> it's something like German armor in England. Yeah. And the upshot of this part of the book is that there was no German armor in England. There are a handful, and a small handful, mind you, of effigies and brasses but like one effigy and two brasses that might show partially german armor wow there's one f one very crude effigy that seems to show german pauldrons and there's a brass that seems to show a german armor of a very unusual sort and i, I believe me i've tried to tease as much as i possibly can out of that yeah. but there is next to no evidence that the english had any regard or interest in german armor at all so if you're a wars of the roses aficionado reenactor etc you got to get rid of the gothic armor folks <laughs> um which yes I'm, I'm sure that will make some people upset but that's that's the truth hey, that's truth the truth hurts. of it or you could be some type of german mercenary or something i guess you could go with a german persona Imagination but could get you anywhere. well there were some germans and swiss weren't there just sort of 1487-ish i think they right. were but in right. the north of england but anyway the um uh, maybe there's also a question there about were the Germans at that point not really exporting? I mean, the Italian export industry was all over Europe. Wasn't it? I mean, there were Germans buying Italian armor. Right. Where well, you can see Italian right. armor in German, uh, you know, um, effect books in treatises. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Italians were really on top of the industrial mass production, weren't they, at that yes. point? And it's, I feel like the Germans sort of caught up with that aspect of it a little bit later. So they were very high quality yeah, yeah. armor in the. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the, the nobility in the German lands throughout most of the 15th century were really impoverished and you know they didn't have the wealth of the Western Europeans and and if you trace German armor you know they are kind of behind the technological curve for a while mm. until it really picks up for them and then the, they in the in the 1470s really. yeah um, and I think oh, it should also perhaps be mentioned that in the 16th century, it's a different situation. Very, and the, there's a whole bunch of German armorers yeah, yeah, yeah. brought in by Henry VIII, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, then, different, yeah. different story. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, but, um, but even then, they were still not working in their own style. They were still yeah. tasked with creating a new style for the Tudor court. Yeah. Um, so it's a very complex story. But in book three, I've really tried to unpack a lot of that. And I've, I've tried to you know, identify tools and approaches that we can use to identify what's what and, and give a good reason why. It's tricky. And I've had to rethink a lot of what I used to think 
and, mm-hmm. and reconsider. There's a lot of 11th hour rewriting of book three. Right. Um, even in the design phase, I was realizing I need a paragraph there. That's wrong. I got to change this term. I can't call this Italian export anymore. I got to call this Italianate because it might be French. I don't know. You know. I'm I'm personally very interested in reading more about French armor and and Flemish armor um, mm-hmm. because there's so little written about that really because it's not you know there's and not that been part a lot is of still research. in its infancy. Yeah. You know, I w- one hope for, you know, that I have for my own work is that it will. It will inspire, you know, new people, younger people to say, OK, I see where Toby's going, but he got this wrong and he should have done this. And actually, I'm going to go further in Portugal. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm in Spain. I'm going to go further with it for the Spanish effigies because there's tons of Spanish effigies. So that's that actually I mean, that's actually something I meant to mention. These aren't only books about English armor. I mean, the, the second book has got a huge section about the development of the salad because that's important all over Europe to everyone. And there are a lot of English people wearing continental, you know, the same types of salads you'd find and, on and the continent. a big problem. The, the reason why half of the second book is helmets is because um, in the 1450s, there was a stylistic change on effigy carving. Up to about 1450, it was it was the typical fashion to show the figure with his helmet on. Yeah. So the story of helmets can be told through the effigies to some extent as well. Whereas from the 1450s, you know, roughly, uh, the bareheaded effigy becomes fashionable, and we lose that. Yeah, but we gain surviving funerary helmets and other things. So from 1450, helmets need to be talked about separately. Yeah, and and similarly in the in the first book, there's quite a bit of information, well rather examples given of Iberian, um, yeah. of, of Spanish art, where there's you know some parallels with English yes. armor, and yes. you know obviously Portugal has a long-standing relationship yes. with there with England. More, there are more Iberian references in book three. Yeah, it becomes ah. a more important connection. Ah, right. It's a connection that I'd like to pursue in the future yeah it, you know i'd love to be able to go around spain for a couple of years yeah. and look at all the effigies. they have fabulous effigies yeah. in spain again you know 10 of which are famous and there's hundreds of them that are that are unknown it seems like some of their considerations around helmets and gauntlets have s- some big overlaps with the, with the english um, but i'd like yeah. to know more about why yeah. you know we know that the english had a complex uh relationship with iberia allied with portugal you know, uh, antagonistic, if not outright, at war with Castile, <laughs> yeah. large parts of the 15th century. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot more there. I'm not saying I'm doing armor of the Spanish knight next. <laughs> oh, I'm not please do that. though. I'm that. not saying that, but, there is, <laughs> but there's definitely three books in that as well. I've just tried to make it the book that I would want it to be. And, you know, I'm I'm hugely inspired by the great, you know, past works of of you know the scholars of our subject you know uh leonello boccia yeah. uh, james mann claude blair uh, you know in my books i've drawn huge inspiration from all of them um i'm not as good as any of them but i think if i'm if i'm taking inspiration from all of them i can become something that that can can stand alongside them. i have to say though so I, I i won't i won't try and um uh challenge your humility there but there are things that have been covered in these books the quality and size of the um photographs but also the illustrations and you've had a number of um, armorers have helped you with these illustrations haven't you do you want yeah. to just say a word about them because that not only are there illustrations of things which might not be clear from the manuscript images or sculptures but in addition there are constructional um thoughts on that and theories about how a certain bever is constructed and operates which to me as someone who uses armor and is looking at getting a new armor to use to fight in this is completely unparalleled to any other book i have on my shelves because i can actually see these are uh, an armorer and an expert's opinions of how did this bever or pauldron articulate how did it work was it leathers was it sliding rivets whatever and that it has a very material use to what happens when i go to my armorer and say hey you know mm-hmm. i think you should be constructing it like this because that's how it will work right. So. right yeah well i mean that the illustrator's input into these books has been you know an essential part of what they are and you know the involvement of the illustrators has has increased and changed and evolved over time um, th- I'm very, very proud of the fact 
that both of the illustrators, there are two illustrators, uh, Robert McPherson and Jeff Wasson, they are both armorers. Mm. Not only that, they're two of the best armorers there are in the world right now and have been for some considerable time. Mm. Uh, so this isn't me explaining to some you know, random artist what I want drawn. These are armorers who are reading my work before publication yeah. and we are discussing it and talking about, okay, these, these are the key points I think we really need to hit, where my textual descriptions of what I think is going on is not good enough. We need to show this, we need to show that. And they're taking that, and then they're saying, yeah, but what about this? And I think you, this is wrong. Actually, Toby, this whole paragraph needs to be changed because that doesn't make any sense, and mm. this is what's actually going on. Mm. And I've, I've rewritten parts of these books because... Mac and Jeff have said, actually, what about this and what about that? And, and, that, and they have actually, increasingly, as the project's gone on, they have had that, that absolutely fundamental influence. Now, that I, I also like the fact, and I'm very proud of the fact, that, that Jeff and Mac are doing two very different forms of illustration that have very precisely defined roles within it. So if we find one of if we can find one of uh, Mac's illustrations that are... Mac introduces each section of each part of the book. And he gives us these uh, full-figure blueprints, essentially, of uh, front, side, and rear views of the, the armor typology that this section is talking about. And this is hugely important because I'm asking everybody to make a leap from a carved piece of alabaster to a totally functional, mechanically plausible armor that will work in every respect if you build it. Mm. So that's a leap because, you know, there are things missing on the effigy. Or Mac is giving us that jump. Here is the blueprint for what this armor typology is or what we think our best guess is. Um, but, then, but then Jeff's uh, job description in the books is totally different. What I wanted is um, I wanted the reader to feel like uh, they had put their book down and gone away and some medieval armorer had snuck into their house <laughs> and just drawn in their book. <laughs> I wanted it because, you know, so many armorers historically were also great draftsmen. Yeah. And they had to draw the designs, the watercolor designs of the Helmschmieds and Jakob Halder and Greenwich. There's loads of these designs that survive. And... And the relationship between armor making and drawing is really important. And I wanted the books, again, to em emphasize the functionality of this equipment, even when it doesn't survive. Mm. I wanted it to feel like an armorer's sketchbook. Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, understanding how these things work, or, or the different theories, and I think one of, one of the great things about um, Jeff Watson's illustrations here is he shows alternate ways that this so we've got a, a spalder up here mm -hmm. the spalder's attached to the top of the rare brace or arm armor and he's given different options for how it might have been articulated you know we've got mm -hmm. sliding rivets we've got internal leathers these are all possibilities and things that we know were used in different armors later on yeah. um Equally here, the Bessagu, you know, it could be laced, it could be hung from a strap. We don't know. These are all possibilities. Probably they were all done by different, yeah, yeah, different, different people, sometimes riveted maybe. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that it's shown even little details like the male um, voider, the way it's shown coming down into the upper arm. So you can see approximately, you can visualize how far down it has to go inside the arm mm -hmm. for it to not pop out when you're right. moving the arm around yeah, yeah, yeah. and this kind of thing. You know, subtle details that only someone who is an artist and an armorer would even bother to even think about. Them. And the visual style is very much, you know, a thing that they've evolved to suit the, the books. Yeah. You know, if, if you look very closely at the artwork in the individual books, you can see how we're refining it and how we're, you know, we're just, you know, just changing it in subtle ways to, to get where we need to be. Cool. So thank you so much, uh, Toby, for your time. Um, I know that my viewers appreciate uh, these videos that I come and do um, with you because your time's valuable, but it's hugely appreciated by me and everybody watching here. Um, and 
these books, I'll put all the links below. So volumes one and two are still currently available, but the numbers are going down. So if you don't have a copy or you want to get a spare copy, do it now before they run out. I think, what did you say? There's only about a hundred left of, about 100 of, book one of the first one. That's about half the run of book two. Yeah, which is not a lot. Um, so, and then for all important for book three, um, if you're able to do so now, I would highly recommend you to get on the pre-order because there's no disadvantages. You'll get it cheaper, you'll get it quicker, and you'll be part of actually helping the print run to, to get made. Um, so highly, highly valuable, um, and it's a book that you'll always want on your bookshelf for the rest of your life. So um, thank you again, Toby. Thank you for watching. Thank you, everyone. Check out the links below, and um, we will see you again soon. Cheers, folks. Bye.